We are in the midst of a global biodiversity crisis. In the, uh, in the last couple of hundred years, we've lost 110 species at least to extinction. 35% uh, of all uh, mammal extinctions on the globe have happened in Australia. And you can see here that there's a linear upward trend in extinctions for mammals. Similar trends are observed for other species. I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard already. But this is not just a concern of greenie academics uh, or even greeny public servants. This is a concern of the whole planet. Uh, this is a, a plot of the greatest risks to the global economy produced by the World Economic Forum in 2019. And you can see there in the top right hand corner where you have high likelihood of a high impact, uh, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse are in the top five risks to the global economy, along with failure to adapt to climate, uh, extreme weather events, natural disasters and the like. So how are we going to deal with this terrible situation that's an existential threat to us and our economy uh, and in the face of the immense uncertainty that we've already heard about from a couple of our speakers today relating to climate. So the key message of my little section here about useful tools is that tools do exist uh, to support complex decisions under uncertainty, but we must be very clear about what we want. Uh, and that's probably the biggest challenge at this stage around using these potentially very powerful approaches. I'm going to introduce something that hopefully many of you have already seen. Thanks to James's group in DELP and the Arthur Ryler Institute, we have a nature kit that helps us rank our biodiversity assets uh, across the state and then using some optimization approaches, come up with the places where we need to act to get the best conservation outcomes for the least cost. And uh, this is an incredibly useful and powerful tool. And this is the state of the art. We have it here in Victoria. At the moment, it's used to help us identify where we need to act under current circumstances. It's not yet dealing with the significant uncertainty we face about future climates and how that impacts on biodiversity. The biggest challenge to using these tools in policy is deciding what we actually want to achieve. And at the moment, we haven't really figured out in a policy sense whether we're just trying to conserve species, or whether we want species and ecosystems conserved, or whether we just want our ecosystems to function. So we really have to sort out our questions before these tools become really powerful and really widely used in policy. We can adapt these kinds of tools to help us understand where we need to conserve now and in the future to deal with the changes to the environment that are occurring right now. And this kind of work has been done. We can apply tools that help us decide where we should conserve to account for the environmental changes that are impacting on biodiversity now and in the future. And we can even deal with the significant uncertainty associated with climate by hedging our bets using modern portfolio theory. This is something that's just emerging now as a potentially extremely valuable uh, biodiversity decision support approach that explicitly trades off between here on the y-axis, our expected value of outcome, in this case, it's of conservation reserves to conserve wetlands in North America. Uh, and we're trading that outcome that we want to achieve against the uncertainty associated with climate change. And uh, that, that, that explicit trade-off allows us to identify robust options that are also achieving some minimally acceptable outcome for biodiversity. The third point I'd like to make is that we just have to try stuff, learn and adapt. There's no adaptive management cycle here in this slide. It's simply just there to say, we've got to reward people for taking risks and trying things. But we also have to have a really clear plan for learning from these experiments. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to generalize our findings and make them useful to other contexts. I'm really impressed with this current bit of work in Nardu Hill. Some of you may know this area well, that Bush Heritage is doing climate matching, the species they wanna conserve on the site and bring bringing seed in from other parts of the country, from, from places that have climates where we expect Nardu Hills to get to in the next 20 or 30 years. This is really cutting edge work and it is working. They're already seeing really interesting results. So one of my favorite examples at the moment from Bush Heritage. The other thing that we have to remember is that 
the bulk of the country is privately owned and under agriculture. And at the moment, our conservation efforts are still very much in the traditional places of conservation reserves. This species here exists 60% uh, of its range in, in uh, rice plantings. Uh, so we really have to learn to work with private landholders if we're gonna conserve that species. And of course, the bulk of the country, 60% of the country is under some form of agriculture. So we need novel and innovative approaches to working with agriculturalists. And a large portion of the country is under native title claim. So unless we can come up with innovative approaches, to working with Indigenous peoples, we're not going to be able to conserve our biodiversity. Thanks very much for your time.